This is Strange New Trek, a podcast about the life and times of Captain Christopher Pike. And now, your hosts. Space. You take your life into your own hands when you go into deep space. Between the natural phenomenon, like brown dwarves and black holes, angry aliens, and technological terrors, in space there are any number of things to remind you that you must die. That is to say, you're here today and gone tomorrow. I'm your host, Jeremy Vilmer, and joining us now is our chief engineer, Chris Noonan Singh. What's happening, Chris? Where's the dog, man? Where's Commander Dog at? Well, Commander Dog is was out of the room when I was doing the introduction, so I didn't think of her, but now she's dropping a toy on my lap. And here's Commander Dog as well. <laughs> but anyhow, what's happening, Chris? Not a whole lot, man. You guys may have listened to our previous two episodes and heard that the audio quality went down a little bit. That that was temporary for the last two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They changed some settings around with this system we use, but we figured it out. And uh, we should be uh, back to normal operation now. Yes. We had a warp <laughs> coil go down or something. I'm not really sure what it was. But anyhow, I don't know if I have a lot of notes before this episode. Is there anything you wanted to bring up before we start? Yeah. Stop putting Uhura in life or death situations. <laughs> we know she's going to pull through. There's zero tension there because I know nothing's happening to her. Stop it. Oh yeah, I could I could see that. I you know what during the episode I can take myself out of it, but like afterwards when I'm thinking about her, right in my notes, I'm like, oh, we know she's gonna be okay. We know it's gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah, and let me just at the top express my dismay at a whole episode centering around the Gorn, and I didn't see one of them, not one rubber suit. No, but you saw three or four ships, so maybe that makes up for it. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, I mean, we'll talk about it more as we go, but I think they're actually making the Gorn, like, terrifying. So, this week, we start with uh, the focus on La'an, Nuni, and Singh. Chris, why don't you give us her voiceover? Security Officer's Log, Stardate 3177.3. The Enterprise is currently en route to deliver an atmospheric processor upgrade to Phenibus 3. Without our assistance, the air on this remote colony will become unbreathable in a matter of weeks. As we prepare for our arrival, we must pause to remember Starfleet Remembrance Day. Now, I wonder if they timed that because this was the episode that came out right before Memorial Day. Yeah, I would think you would. If, you know, if you're, you know, you're going to do that, if you're going to do a Halloween episode, you want to make sure you're not putting them in the middle of August kind of thing. I've never heard of Starfleet Remembrance Day before, but I mean, it's cool. Well, it went out of fashion before the next generation. It makes sense that they would have something like that. Well, by the time the later shows came along, they just kept renaming the ships for the dead ships, and everybody forgot them. Kind of like naming all your dogs George, you know, and not being able to tell them apart. <laughs> so we start with Lan sitting in her quarter. She's looking down at a pin that commemorates the loss of the SS Puget Sound. Throughout the ship, the other members of the crew are wearing similar pins, including Captain Pike, who addresses the entire ship. Many of them knew someone who had made the ultimate sacrifices, officers, scientists, and civilians who had given their lives for the hope of galactic peace. Exploration could exact a heavy toll, and there was nothing more devastating to a captain than losing a member of the crew. For those left behind, they would wear the insignia of past ships that they served on. As we honor the lives that we have been given, let us also be grateful to still be on the journey. Yeah, that sounds like something they would have pulled from real life, but I've never heard of anything like that. Yeah, it it does sound like, I don't know, something, it does sound kind of like that. I mean, I guess like where you have that sunken ship in Hawaii. But the Arizona. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's a button instead of an actual ship. You know, it, it's a, a memory token instead of the actual thing. Because I guess you lose a ship in space, you're probably not having commemoratives hanging around from it. We don't lose too many ships these days, so... Maybe that was something back in the day. I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's why we don't recognize that uh, that sort of thing. That's fair. Uh, we cut away to uh, Hammer and Uhura walking through the ship, and he asks her about the AP-350 device. Uhura calls it an air filter, and <laughs> much to Hammer's aggravation. 
After voicing his disapproval, Uhura gives him a full history of the device and how it operates and what it does. You know, I have uh, been around some old crusty maintenance dudes who are like this. They want you to spell out every tiny detail, even if they don't know it, <laughs> before like uh, they're cool with you. I I've met some, some old crusty engineers like that at the shipyard back when I first started. Even in the Air Force, there were some folks like that. Hammer, I don't know if I'll, uh, how much more I'll focus on it, but he kind of he gets crustier every 10 minutes, it seems like. I don't know. I like that about him, though. Oh, yeah, no, look, I love grouchy people. You know, they remind me of me. <laughs> uh, Hammer gives her points for that answer, and then Uhura compares engineering to linguistics, and Hammer basically tells her to get off his lawn. <laughs> well, Anne arrives on the bridge. Number one notes her lack of a dedication pin, and I immediately flash back to Seinfeld's AIDS walk episode when Kramer wouldn't wear a ribbon. <laughs> but Anne points out that she doesn't want anyone inside of her head fixing her. And Ortegas reports that they are in orbit. Christina wonders where everyone is. Spock speculates that the brown dwarf could be blocking comms. But then they discover the communication satellite has been destroyed. They cannot tell if it's accidental or natural. Uh, and they put off jumping to conclusions until they can actually gather uh, intelligence on an excursion. Number one uh, forms a team, tells Lon to join her. Beaming down, they discover a deserted colony, even though there uh, should be hundreds of people. Well, I notice his blast marks, and there's a dog <laughs> There's a dog jump scare, like Friday the 13th, kind of. <laughs> and then we get what may be the bloodiest shot I have ever seen in an episode of Star Trek, that overhead shot where they're just showing smeared blood going to the center of the room. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, all the colonists were dragged to a location, leaving just a big, nasty blood trail, like a bunch of bleeding snails. On the Enterprise, they detect an unidentified ship, and Pike has the landing party beam back. The unknown ship has no Federation markings and has its shields up. They attempt to hail the ship to no avail. Pike orders a yellow alert, but then they are held by the mystery ship. They find a, um, a bloody Professor Thandy on the other side of the hail. Her ship is full of wounded. Life support is pretty much tapped out. They like, try to beam them off or want to beam them off, but the material the ship's made out of makes that impossible. Pike orders Zuniga to deploy boarding tubes. Okay, now i got to take an aside here. Did you notice what Zuniga was wearing? Uh, He was wearing the dress variant of the modern uniform. Was he? Yes, he was. Why was he wearing that? Well, you know, some guys are comfortable that way. You know, look at those g couple guys back at the beginning of Next Generation running around in their little cheerleader outfits. Oh, 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 you're talking about the female variation of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, dress, not dress uniform, but like a dress. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, dress, dress uniform. <laughs> yeah, leggings and a dress. Years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine about the, the scant outfit on TNG and why guys would be running around in uh, miniskirts. And I decided that even all the way back to the next generation, if a dude wanted to wear a dress, he probably got a dress. <laughs> Starfleet doesn't hang up on that stuff. You know, they don't, they don't worry about that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I did not notice that he was wearing the female variation of the uniform. Yeah, that's cool, though. I thought it was a quick and easy to miss detail that they had, you know. Yeah, I barely remember that you see people in the next generation wearing it. Yeah, just that first episode or two. They cycled that miniskirt out of next gen quick. <laughs> Fandy uh, tells them that a blast from the sky basically took the colony ships out. Pike looks at Spock, who sees no signs of additional ships. The Enterprise deploys the uh, tube connecting the two ships. When asked if she remembers anything, Fandy says a farmer saw a rain on fire falling from the sky. There are about 100 survivors. Lan asks Thandy about the rest. Thandy says she doesn't know. There were no body bodies, just blood marks that would even let you know they were ever there. Number one, and Lan speculate on what weapons might have been used. A young girl runs by them, screaming about monsters. Lan stops her and asks her about the monsters. The girl's father was taken by them. She didn't see them. She only heard them, and they made a clicking or clucking sound. And basically all the color drains out of Lan's face here. And she tells Pike to uh, scan for EM signatures. Spock detects a hologram near the second moon. Lan tells them to raise the shields, but they can't since the tube is deployed. Pike just says, oh no. And it was actually one of the scariest oh no's I've ever seen on anything. Because you can tell he knows what's coming. Yeah, man. Yeah. Lan freezes as she sees the Gorn ship approach and open fire. 
Number one pulls her away as a cargo ship and transport tube are destroyed. Lyanne imagines her brother as she comes to in sickbay. Several members of the crew have been injured. Una is leaning against the wall with her guts leaking out. Una lets uh, Lyanne know that the mother of the little girl didn't make it. And when Lyanne asks about the little girl specifically, uh, number one just kind of shakes her head. Yeah, I don't know if that was meant to signify she didn't make it or that Una didn't know. Yeah, it could be either one, and I, I, I think it's safe to assume she didn't make it. Yeah. Going to her brother right here, I did not understand that that was who we were looking at until later. Yeah, they kept it kind of cryptic. The first time I saw him, I was like, wait, are they like acting like the Gorn can shapeshift or something? <laughs> well, that would be cool if they were, if the Gorn were shapeshifters who like to appear like dudes in rubber suits. La'an kind of looked scared every time, at least for the first couple of times she saw him. So I was like, hmm. What is this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I assumed it was some form of PTSD, but I didn't know who the who the character was at the first couple sightings, you know. Pike calls down to Hammer that the warp drive is offline. Hammer is in the main cargo bay attempting to secure the processor as it was unsafe while under fire. Pike orders him to work fast so he can restore warp power. Ortegas tells Pike that they can make about half speed, and he calls out an evasive pattern. Lyanne enters and tells him that they have to retreat. She points out that it was a Gorn making them vulnerable, using the colonists as bait. The Enterprise needs to fall back and regroup. It's in really bad shape. Laan is in pretty rough shape as she keeps uh, hallucinating. Pike remembers the brown dwarf Spock saw earlier, and it's tethered to a black hole. Surrounding it, though, is a glass, <laughs> a giant gas cloud that they could hide in. Did you get the sense that Pike was getting kind of sick or take his snappy comebacks in this episode? A little bit. I mean, I get it, though. Like, uh, because at one point she was like, well, your science officer just said uh, we probably shouldn't do that. Pike kind of rolled his eyes about that, but. Yeah, he kind of stared daggers at her twice, told her once to knock her shit off, and then rolled his eyes once, too, you know. (laughs) He tells her to focus on one problem at a time. If they can make it to the gas cloud. They will have reduced abilities. Sensors, shields, communications will all be down, but so would any pursuers. Sauce for the goose, as Spock might one day say, oh, you know, in the 1980s at some point. (laughs) Pike checks with Land. She is acting number one again, and she agrees with his plan. Pike orders the ship to head in at full impulse, which I guess means half impulse, since they can only get half their speed. Yep. The Gorn ship keeps firing. Spock announces that Sick Bay and the main cargo hold have taken direct hits. Inside the main cargo bay, Uhura regains consciousness and calls out for Hammer. The chief engineer's right arm is crushed under a cargo container, and he asks her to help get it off. She's able to lift it just enough for him to get free, but he can feel that his hand is broken. Uhura tries to get him over to sick bay, but the door is blocked, and he asks if the door is blocked, and Uhura confirms that it is. Just then, a new alarm begins to go off. The coolant system on the AP-350 are in critical failure. Inside the conference room, Pike, Lyon, Spock, and Ortegas are joined on screen by Hammer and Uhura and Dr. Mbenga. Hammer reports that he will be working on repairs and closes the channel. Pike notices that the temperature is rising, and Spock reports that the ionic gas surrounding the ship is affecting the temperature controls, and other systems are still offline. And being it adds that this includes sick bay with no medical systems, they had been essentially reduced to triage. Number one enters sick bay, but almost immediately collapses to the deck. And Binga points out that she had said she was fine, and she admits that she wasn't. She had taken several <laughs> deep puncture wounds from the shrapnel. They can't power up the surgical base to remove them. And Binga recalls Chapel is interested in archaeological medicine, and asks how good she is at sewing. Aces is Chapel's reply. <laughs> <laughs> Archaeological medicine. That's hilarious. She is what older people would call a firecracker, I believe, you know? I think so, yeah. Back in the conference room, Lyon goes over the options. They could not use their phasers, and when Pike asks about photon torpedoes, which would be self guided, she reports that the torpedo bay had been hit and they were down to one torpedo. Spock adds that the number of torpedoes was inconsequential because if they fired one off in the brown dwarf, it would go, uh, its internal guidance would go offline and it would fail. I didn't understand that. A torpedo bay, the torpedo bay had been hit. I don't know much about photon torpedoes, but I feel like if um, the bay in which, first of all, I don't think that the 
the area that they store photon torpedoes would be on the outside of the ship like that on the you know outside uh adjacent to the outside of the ship okay so you know when you look straight on at the enterprise and there's three big circles on the front of the saucer section i get that's where they get shot from but they're talking about since the torpedo bay had been hit they only have one torpedo but shouldn't they have like a torpedoes in reserve that they can bring up from somewhere if I have to uh, point this out, I totally agree with you because that was the one, the one real moment where I was scratching my head in this episode. I was like, <laughs> "Really?" <laughs> Would the rest just kind of evaporate? Just you know, oh, we had them. Well, we don't know where they went. So where I was going with uh, my first statement about the space in which they store them being probably not adjacent to the skin of the ship. If they were down to one torpedo, that says to me that the place in which they store them was hit, which I feel like uh, would have probably blown the whole ship up if that would have happened. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure how photon torpedoes work. I know they always show them like in, in a casing, you know. I always assumed it was going to be like some binary thing like matter, antimatter or something. But I honestly don't know how it works. Now, it could be that they're immune to being hit like that and they don't do anything they only work through a timer or some kind of detonator yeah but i don't think it works like that even though oh in discovery pike um had one detonate near spock shuttle if you recall so you can you can at least set a timer on it but i don't think that's the normal mode of operation no i don't think so either i think it's usually contact yeah so this whole this whole scene just kind of took me out of it for a minute I got to give that to you. It would be fair to say we're down to one tube left. Yeah. But if you're telling me you only have photon torpedoes that are loaded in the tubes and that's it, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> yeah. You know, they used to, back in the old days, they'd publish what the full payload of photon torpedoes that the Enterprise and the Enterprise D could carry, but I don't know what they were. Yeah, you know, you could do that. You'd say, yeah, the uh, two of the tubes are offline. One is still functional, but we can't reload it. Yeah, they could have said that. I guess I would have bought it. You no, know, whatever's wrong with it, we can't reload it. You know, we have to, we're going to have to repair the, the Guggenheim to be able to load more. <laughs> Not very good at the track, no babble myself. So that was Spock points out that they can't. Oh, yeah, because the guidance system wouldn't work. So if they launched it, it wouldn't go anywhere, anyways. Ortegas is asking what they do with no shields and no weapons, and is also dismissive about it being Gorn, calling them the boogeymen, as no one had ever seen one. Lyanne has seen them, however, and she doesn't <laughs> think they are supernatural, and she does think they are monsters. She says Gorn have eyes that are both dead and hungry at the same time, and the Gorn see humans as prey. That kind of reminds me of uh, Quint's description of Jaws. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I could absolutely see that. Lan corrects Ortega's assumption that no one's ever seen him, saying that plenty of people have seen Gorn. They just don't live to tell about it. Pike ends the meeting by telling them all to be vigilant and get creative, calling them the best of Starfleet, and that they would survive by working together. As everyone leaves, Pike asks Lan to stay and asks how she's doing. Lan has uh, made clear that she does not care about how the crew thinks about her, and that she's always just been blunt. But Pike points out that right now her job is not just about orders, it was also about hope. He considers belief to be the difference between victory and defeat. And if one got a crew to believe in miracles, they might just deliver one. Lyon accepts that she has to make an adjustment, but makes clear she will not lie to the crew. The captain simply asks her to tell if anything came to mind. Yeah, when somebody says they don't care about what the people around them think about them that's usually a lie yes <laughs> very much so they usually care very much about what the people around them think about them at least in my experience i'm not a psychologist so you know i could be wrong on that but you know right here she's acting like i'm as uh strictly unemotional as a as a vulcan but we've seen even in these four episodes that that is just not the case yeah, seriously not the case with her. For better or worse, I'm not saying uh, her emotions have gotten the best of her and she's uh, you know, made some stupid mistakes because of them, but if you remember 
the episode with the egg, man, like she's constantly let letting emotions get the best of her, uh, given like the bullets she stares into Uhura like every five seconds. <laughs> yeah, she she's kind of all over the angry button in that one. So back in the cargo bay, Hammer laments that the engineer's most important tools were his hands and his mind, but he was unable to use the fingers on one hand. Uhura sits him down as the alarms on the AP-350 continue to blare. Uhura points out that she was the only one with a working set of fingers. Hammer is not particularly fond of teamwork, and I was shocked by this revelation. But Uhura <laughs> retorts that he should get fond, which was a great little moment, you know. He grudgingly agrees that he has to and tells her to use the uh, control panel to shut down the safety overrides while also adjusting the cooling system. Back on the bridge, Spock offers an idea to Pike, remembering how he challenged him to get creative and brings a tactical projection on screen. Though they had no primary sensors, the navigation systems constantly updated with atmospheric data to maintain stability. So he decides he can kind of rig up the gas cloud to act like a form of, he says radar, I think, but it's actually more like sonar. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, Battlestar's Dratus. Uh, system it's kind of like a cross between the two and then obviously they're in space so you get all the directions uh, that's what it seemed like he was doing especially as um they watched the gorn ship kind of pass right through them well it wasn't through them it was either like relatively above or below them but damn near bumped into them though yeah this whole scene reminded me of like uh pretty much any time you see a movie and there's a submarine involved in a tense situation. Everybody's sweating bullets. I was kind of waiting for Pike to go to silent running and stuff and start whispering. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I obviously, as, as somebody who's watched a, a lot of Star Trek, it immediately brought Balance of Terror and the Wrath of Khan to mind. Because in the Wrath of Khan, they're doing the Mutar and Nebula. And to your point, Balance of Terror everybody's running silent and they're, they're taking these long pot shots at each other, trying to guess where the completely invisible ship is, you know, very tense, uh, battle kind of like what we have here. Now, I mean, I get that, uh, the reason is cause like, uh, the cooling stuff's not on and it's hot in there, but it just, I don't know the way it was shot. It just reminded me of those submarine movies where they're having like a tense situation in the sub and everybody's like sweating bullets. And again, like i I thought any second Pike was going to ask for, um, you know, silent running and people were going to start whispering and trying to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can see that. And, uh, the episode balance of terror, when that was written, it actually cribbed parts from a script of a submarine movie. I can't remember what, what the movie was, but, uh, basically what they were writing was a submarine in space story. And it inspired the fight between the enterprise and the reliant in, uh, the wrath of Khan. So yeah, I can. I don't know much about sub, you know, submarine combat. Obviously, you'd be the expert in that field here. Nope, uh, I'm an expert at fiber optics on a submarine, but that's about <laughs> it. I'm just saying, like from movies, <laughs> I don't know what it's like to be stationed on a submarine. I just know what it's like to work on one uh, while it's in dry dock. Yeah, well, I got you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a giant hole in my notes right here. So they they do that with the gla gas clouds. So they have like a sonar radar kind of set up with that. And then Pike comes up with the idea since they can't launch the torpedo, they're going to drop the torpedo and get over something with a little more mass, gently push it out the door and let gravity pull it down to the target. Ortega brings the ship directly over the Gorn vessel and Pike orders the torpedo deployed. Just then, however, three more signals are detected approaching them, and Pike realizes that this was the Gorn's intention, sacrificing one ship to find their quarry. One of the incoming signals is a Gorn destroyer, much, much larger than the other ships. <laughs> With the odds now three on one, Lyanne suggests retreat. Ortegas points out what Spock had said about the density fields near the center crushing the ship, but Pike knows what would happen to them and to the Gorn, and he has faith in the Enterprise. Again, here's our theme with Pike. There's always the faith in his crew, in his ship. It seems like they've kind of hit a, hit it almost every episode of the show so far. And they definitely, you know, leaned on it pretty heavily in uh, Discovery Season 2. Yeah, but I don't know. When he says it this time, I don't know. I'm like, 
you have no flipping idea what your ship is going to do here. <laughs> Stop lying. Yeah, it felt a little, <laughs> a little like, huh? <laughs> well, I guess if we all die, nobody will know I was wrong. <laughs> you know, it did feel a little, <laughs> little disingenuous, maybe. Yeah, plus, um, right here they they well, it's not yet, but you start hearing the uh the hole doing some ominous creaking and all that stuff again, reminiscent of um a submarine maybe going a a little bit outside of their depth range or something. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's uh, when the, when the creaking hits, it's actually pretty cool because you just get this feeling like that, that whole ship is just going to crumple into a ball around them. Now, he didn't like the idea any more than they did, but they had to do it, and order, he orders Ortegas to take them down. It is also noticeable in the cargo bay where Hammer continues to guide Uhura in stabilizing the AP-350. Hammer tells her that the malfunctioning rods would be cool and tells her to make sure before she pulls any out. On the bridge, Pike listens to the ominous creaking of the hull, and Spock reports lower decks have begun to buckle. The evacuations are not complete, but Spock warns that if it was not contained, the failure of the hull could end up decompressing the entire ship. So, I, I'm not going to get into the thing here, but Pike orders the bulkhead sealed, which leads to the death of at least one crewman that we see. Yeah, I mean, again, this so reminds me of... Uh... One of the early Battlestar episodes where they have to make a similar decision. If you recall, like Chief is sitting there at the the station to, you know, shut down the bulk or you know to seal the bulkheads, and uh, he doesn't want to do it. And uh, the XO is just sitting there, basically screaming over him, like, "No, you need to do this right now, or we're gonna lose the whole ship." <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, and they kind of did the thing with Lieutenant Kyle where they had shown him and this other guy greet each other once before. And then during this scene, Kyle was doing something. The guy walks by, they greet each other again. And then as the bulkheads are getting ready to seal, they're running towards it. And the fellow in the blue shirt shoves Kyle through because there isn't time to get them both through. So, it's, you know. Yeah, it's just one of those things. I heard he was also two days from retirement and about to get married. Yeah, that's the way it always is. Yep, yep. Land reports the reading to Pike, and Spock assures the captain he made the logical choice. Pike asks why he didn't feel that way, but Spock reminds him that's because he made the choice because he values life. Yeah, that was a callback to me. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and all that jazz. Yep. And if he didn't value life, it'd be easy for him to seal a bulkhead and lose a lose a person and just act like nothing had happened, you know? Or, you know, have the whole ship just... Fall apart. Yeah, lose the whole ship instead of just one person. He calls the battle stations and orders the crew to prepare for close quarters before having Ortegas bring the ship to a full stop. All right, so we got a captain's log. You got this one? Captain's Log, Supplemental, Enterprise is currently in the center of a gas giant, hiding from an enemy we've never faced before. So far, three civilians and seven of my crew have lost their lives. The battle is far from over, but I am determined to keep everyone else alive. My newest obstacle is the presence of a nearby black hole. Yeah, I did not catch, um, actually this is news to me that there's civilians up there. They got a handful of the survivors off that colony ship. Oh, that's that's true. Not nah, I forgot about that. Well, you know, it was easy to lose track of because they just kind of made it look like they're standing in a dirty hallway and then everybody died. But you got to remember, they pulled people out of there because Una and Leanne wouldn't have made it to sick bay if people hadn't been getting pulled out of the area. So I'm wondering if um six of those crewmen were on the, you know, the tube or whatever. No, it could very well be. Because he only loses one to the, uh, when he's shutting the bulkheads down. Yeah. Now, it could it could very well be that the six of them were there. So, Spock reports that the atmospheric density was decreasing and the singularity is advancing its accumulation of substellar matter. When <laughs> Anne asks if he ever spoke plain English, Spock does so, saying that the brown dwarf they were hiding in was being sucked into a black hole. I have one brief little thing to bring up here, and I was going to save, save this one for uh, picking nets, but I want to do it here while it's fresh in my mind. She says something about him speaking plain English, right? Mm hmm But even in this show, we've heard them refer to Federation Basic. And do you think <laughs> English would sound like... I've always assumed that they weren't speaking English English, but some, like, 
planetary agreed upon version of English that was called Federation Basic. Yeah, what is that like, uh, Esperanza or whatever? Yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, it was on Babylon 5, they had Interlac, and, you know, they had these languages that were like supposed to be easier for all language speakers that would be involved to use. And I always assumed the Federation Basic would be some kind of Earth language, probably based on English, since most people use English as a trade language. But it's 300 years in the future. I mean, they're probably using it interchangeably, I would imagine. Yeah, could be. I just, I just, you know, kind of buckled a little bit. Plus, consider where Lon comes from. She was on a colony ship, so. Oh, yeah, she wouldn't be. Some of the older sayings would still be intact on that ship, most likely. That's just how I took it. Yeah, and this was also primary in my mind because somebody on one of the Facebook groups that watches this show, they were complaining about some part of how they use English. And I wrote, but then did not hit send on, do you think they're speaking English, you chucklehead? But, you know, I, le- I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't now. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would have stuck my big old foot right in my mouth there, you know? Pike sees the problem. If they stay, they would be taken with, with it, by that meaning the uh, the brown dwarf. They could not leave the brown dwarf without being spotted by the Gorn, and they had no long-range communication, so they can't send out a probe. Spock agrees and decides to join uh, Leanne, and this is going on the uh, uh, Galileo, because she would need backup. Aboard the Galileo, Spock and Leanne observe what appears to be two remaining Gorn ships scanning each other. While her memory is fragmented, she is certain she's seen lights before. So throughout this episode, they kind of say and hint at the fact that Leanne's memory is hampered by the trauma she suffered while she was held prisoner by the Gorn. That makes sense. Yeah, like she's literally blocking the memories and accepts the fact that she's blocking the memories. Spock notes the complexity of the mind and how it built up defenses after being afflicted by trauma. Lan thinks there was something to it that she should know. A thought Spock finds understandable, given the nature of their foe. So Spock is going to give her the old Vulcan mind meld here, which is funny because earlier in the episode she said she didn't want anybody poking around in her head trying to fix her. And now she's quite literally going to have somebody poking around her head trying to fix her. Well, he's not trying to fix her. He's just trying to see what she saw. That's all. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. (laughs) Spock moves from his seat and kneels in front of her, placing one hand against her face and initiates the mind meld. As Leanne's memories surface, she finds herself on a Gorn breeding planet where the crew of the Puget Sound had been brought to feed the hatchlings and they were hunted day and night. The memory of her younger self running through the caverns with her brother Manu resurfaces. Becoming her current self in the memory, Lan pleads with her brother to come with her, but he knows that, she, that he can't and again tells her to run. She runs, finding herself back in the central cavern. Now, don't forget here, the important part of this whole scene is the fact that her brother gives her a journal that kind of deciphers their language and visual communication so it kind of looks like some morse code type deal that they have going on uh i see a lot of dots or uh, you know yeah for lack of a better word dots and dashes and stuff so it's some kind of morse code type thing yep and the brother has figured out what some of the words mean or a lot of the words but he's kind of decoded some of the language she explains that what she learned about the lights from her brother's journal. Lyanne realizes, oh, so when you're in a mind meld, it kind of flows both ways, right? Like your mind into my mind, my mind into your mind. So while Spock is in there poking around in her head, a glimpse of Michael Burnham shows up to Lyanne. And she realizes that he had a sister who sacrificed herself for him. but kind of pokes at it and asks about it because there is no record that Spock ever had a sister. Yeah, I guess Starfleet scrubbed all that. Yep, so we get a little more explanation why we never heard about her on, you know, Star Trek. Makes sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I like the way that they did that in universe, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, they had to fix it somehow, you know, and there you go. So the shuttle takes position near uh, the smaller of the two Gorn ships, and Spock has modulated the shuttle's phasers per lance instructions. 
She surprised that he agreed to the idea, and he replies that it was a good plan. And the mind meld reminded him of risk taken and their value to those who survive. She transmits a signal saying that the humans have boarded the smaller ship and taken control, <laughs> knowing that the Gorn would cull the weak, believing in the survival of the fittest. Sure enough, the larger ship opens fire, destroying the smaller one and evening the odds. Back aboard the Enterprise, Uhura has finished rebooting the system for the AP-350 and sees him or is starting to fade from the pain. She tries to keep him talking, asking how an ANR ended up in Starfleet, as she had always thought they were pacifists. And they kind of get into a little philosophical discussion here about how what Starfleet does is like pacifism at its at its core most value. Yeah, because he says something about, you know, he won't fight for Starfleet but would defend its ideals. But I don't know, man. Like, maybe you can claim ignorance while you're sitting down there in the engine room, but you are... 100% contributing to not pacifist ideas, whether it's in self-defense or not. I mean, I guess normally it is given the nature of the Enterprise's mission, but I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with what he's saying here. Yeah, and there's there's levels of pacifism, too. I don't know if you ever saw a movie from the 70s called Billy Jack. Nope. And it was about this... Uh, part Indian Green Beret who comes back from the war and turns his back on society, goes to the reservation, and there's like a hippie school there, and then teaches this Montessori-style system, and he's like their protector. And they're all pacifists, and he's supposed to be a pacifist, but every time something happens against the school or one of the kids there, Billy Jack shows up and karate kicks the shit out of everybody, and everybody <laughs> else just kind of acts like, oh, that's just what happens when Billy shows up, you know? <laughs> But then they'll go on about their dedication to pacifism later. That's kind of what Hammer was doing here, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in, in, in certain respects, sure. Yeah, it's look, he's, he's, he's charging a battery. He's not actually pushing the fire button, you know, and maybe that's enough for him. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. See, maybe that's enough. <laughs> she tries to keep him talking, asking how an anor ended up in Starfleet as she had thought they were all pacifists. We went through that conversation. The only thing they could do now was vent the bay into space and everything in it. And Hora points out that they're in there as well. And Hammer says that that's kind of unfortunate and agrees. On the bridge, Pike <laughs> listens as Hammer reports the AP-350 would explode within 20 minutes, maybe less. Spock and Lion return from their mission and assume their stations. Ortega's comments on how space wanted them dead, which gives Pike an idea. What if we let space win? He asked Spock if it was possible to use the black hole's gravity to slingshot their way to safety. Spock says that, it's, that it would, because it's mathematically possible, but the Gorn would also see him and pursue him. Pike is confident the ship would hold. Lan is thinking back to her prior discussion with Pike. Agrees. In the cargo bay, Hammer commits... Oh, wait. So they decide they're going to use the exploding AP-350 to uh, cover something up here. So <laughs> Hammer is in the cargo bay, <laughs> and he's preparing to dump this thing. And he, and he does like a little ceremony of co uh, committing it back to the cosmos. Uhura holds up a strap that will secure them with a shaking hand. Hammer grabs her arm with his good hand and commends her. She had managed to impress him, after all, and he would give her high marks on the assessment. Uhura thanks him and assumes that this will still matter. Now look, is this the old, let me fire some trash out of the torpedo tube and hope the ship upstairs thinks that we're dead? Is that what's happening here? Pretty much, except they're... They're actually going to show an explosion <laughs> with it, but yeah, that's pretty much what they're doing. Because there's a bunch of unsecured stuff in the cargo bay, so it all kind of gets sucked out the back, but is that what's happening? I felt like that's what was happening. Let me throw some trash out the torpedo tube, and hopefully the ship up there will think we're dead and stop depth charging us. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> basically what's going on here. They're going to try to zip away right after this AP-350 explodes, so they're going to use the old, the old, uh, the old switcheroo. They're going to drop that thing. It's going to explode. I'm assuming creating a bright flash. They're going to zip away while that's happening. And they're going to leave like, you know, their garbage cans and stuff behind. <laughs> and Gorn, not realizing what spaceships are made of, they're going to, you know, assume that galvanized garbage cans are how you build it, how you build an enterprise. 
Hammer notes that the humans worried much, too much about death, while the A&R believe that the end can only come once you have fulfilled your purpose. Uhura asks him what his purpose is, and his is to fix what is broken. He asks her what she felt the purpose of her life was. I don't believe she knew what it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because if, if that's your philosophy, then you don't really know. Like, your purpose could be something different than what you thought it was. Yeah. And that's uh, kind of his answer to it as well, is that there's only one way to find out, and they secure themselves to the deck. Well, you didn't die, so obviously your purpose is not fulfilled. <laughs> yep, yep. Zuniga reports the inertial dampeners are at maximum and calls some brace for heavy gravity. Pike reminds them uh, of what was said earlier about the cost of exploration and believes that there will always be something to challenge them, but they would not back down or give in to fear. Was that another pike inspirational speech? That's it. I, you know, when this season's done, we're going to have to do a super cut and an episode where we just do a super cut of Pike's inspirational speeches, I think. <laughs> the Warren ship changes course as the Enterprise approaches the accretion disk of the black hole. Weighed down by the increased gravity, Spock strains to reach the controls but manages to do so. Himmer grabs Uhura's arm and they hold on for dear life. Outside the reach of the black hole's gravity, the Gorn detect the explosion of the AP-350. Thinking it to be the Enterprise, they fall back. <laughs> a moment later, the Enterprise slingshots free of the black hole's gravity, battered and singed, but intact. As lights come back up, Pike asks for a report. He hails him and uh, Uhura, hoping to hear from him. After a moment of silence, he concludes that both are dead. He's about to order Land to send a recovery team when Uhura's voice finally comes in, reporting that they were both all right. Much to the relief of the captain and the bridge crew, even Spock smiles a little. <laughs> Lyon wonders about the next time, knowing that the Gorn had never come that far inside Federation space before, and Pike is confident that next time they would not be caught by surprise. Back in sick bay, Una regains consciousness and finds herself connected to Mbinga by an intravenous line. The doctor had given her, given her his blood so she could stay alive. In her quarters, Lyanne puts on the pin commemorating the Puget Sound and joins Pike, who is honoring the seven lost crewmen with her caskets draped in the flag of the Federation. Overall, a good episode. I like the, uh, the space combat episodes, especially when they manage to keep it that tense the whole time. Yeah, I mean, again, though, they're trying to use Uhura for, for tension. It's just... I can't like just stop. Don't even do it. We know she survives, so you're not you're not putting her in danger because we already know she makes it through. Yep, my little brother had his picture taken with the actress like eight years ago, so I, I know who I was fine for a very long time after this. <laughs> you know, so for what it was, it was a good episode because, like uh, I've said before, one of my favorite episodes of the original series is Balance of Terror, which is a ship to ship combat, but. Back in the old days, your your good guys had to win, right? The Enterprise barely limped out of this one. Yeah, they didn't win. Yeah. They just barely scraped through, you know. And uh, the only reason it's anything close to a win is because the last Goran ship just gave up. Well, they didn't give up. They just um, they had um, some evidence that the Enterprise was dead. Yeah. So... Do you think they're making the Gorn scary? Because I certainly do. No, I'm I'm here for it. Yeah, I wanted to see him, but something that I complain about in the um, Text Chainsaw Massacre, you see the monster too early. You see Leatherface way too early in both the original and the remake. I prefer it to be more like Jaws, where you don't really see the full brunt of the monster until like near the end. So I hope that's kind of something they're doing with this. Yeah. So I got a couple nits I got to pick here. Do you have any? Yeah, mine was uh, the Uhura issue and then um, the uh, whole conversation about photon torpedoes and the bays and the tubes and all that. But um, we already kind of talked about those. So Yeah. Back in the episode of the original Star Trek called The Dagger of the Mind, Spock says he has never used a mind meld on a human being prior to that. Is La'an a, a human? Well, I was going to say, now, can you make the argument that because she has augment uh, ancestry, she's not human? 
I could also make the argument that it was an early episode of the ne- of the original series, and they didn't know it was going to need to run for another 115 years. I guess either one's fine, but it was it's one of those things that sets off my nerd alert, you know? No, I understand what you mean, but I think, I mean, given that um, I'm a huge fan of Friday the 13th and trying to justify any little change in the story or... <laughs> whatever uh just to make everything fit um i'm okay with saying that she may not be considered a a regular human because of her well you know actually i'm not sure that that's even the case because in the last episode she said that she got picked on for being an augment but she wasn't one yeah but if if con is a direct an- which we still don't know but if con were a direct ancestor then she's going to have augmented genetics, which whether or not she she's Captain America, the background is still there. Yeah, I don't know. See, that's another issue with bringing La'an in here and tying her back to Khan. Why? You're convoluting a canon that doesn't need to be convoluted. All this room that you can run around and play in and you went back to Khan again. Yeah, I mean, on the Enterprise, man. If La'an was just out in the world, fine and they run across her, cool. But this is one of the problems with the fact that they made her a part of the crew. I don't, I still don't understand that choice because so far it has meant nothing. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Except for an argument she had with Una in the last episode. And even that, you could have made her like literally anybody else and she still could have had that same argument with Una. Oh, yeah, absolutely, especially since she was delirious with light fever. Well, and they could have just spun it a different way. No, what I'm saying is whoever was there would have been all venomous and hateful anyways, you know? Well, like Lyon says later, though, after everybody calms down, she says, basically, yeah, you know, yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, a little bit more emotional than I normally am, but I'm not sorry for what I said. <laughs> I guess my point of that is it wasn't only because she was having those issues with the light that made her say that. No, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down there. So they, they could have just picked anybody to make it fit that argument if they still needed that for the story. Now, it could be there's some crazy big reason why a Noonien Singh is on the ship, but at this point, it still seems like, why? Why would you do that? Because you're writing yourself into a corner for literally no reason. Yeah, and see, that's why at first I was sure it was going to turn out that they weren't on a colony ship. They were on a sleeper ship and then rescued by the Federation or something, you know. Which, obviously, they can't do now. They've they've pulled themselves out of that. But I thought it'd be cool to have her suddenly turn out to be like an actual crew member of and, you know, family member of Khan. Just, you know, escaped on a different ship or something. But, you know, I guess we'll have to wait and see how they pull all that together, huh? Yeah, I mean, there's got to be some some crazy payoff to having her as a Noonien Singh. Otherwise, what's the point? No, that's that's absolutely true. But again, you know, we're, we're back to that thing where ever since Khan was introduced, they've been chasing a sugar high built around him ever since, you know? Let's do some math, though, okay? Yes. Because we know about when... Khan was on the ship, and we know about when La'an was born. So she was born 2228, and Khan was in power from, I think, 96 to 98, or 94 to 98, or something like that. So he got put on the Botany Bay. Um, We can't necessarily say that when Kirk found him and he died, or we can't really say that his natural life extended to when Kirk and him had the final showdown in Rathacon. So if he'd have never gotten found, they're like a couple hundred years removed from each other. So maybe her last name doesn't matter at all. Yeah, it could very well be. It'd just like be, being stuck with like Mussolini or something two, two, three hundred years after Benito Mussolini. Yeah, so I just did her birth date minus like 1996, and it's almost 250 years, 230-something. So... Because, like I said, you can't really take the end of Khan's natural life into, you know, Wrath of Khan times, even though that's when it actually happened. But, like, barring that, he would have lived and died 
a couple hundred years before Laan was even born. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, even if we move it, you know, because we're playing fast and loose with the dates now, but. Even if he was a little long lived, I mean, that would still put, I don't know, 100, 150, almost 200 years. So you're still looking at a long time in between uh, the two of them. So maybe her name doesn't matter at all, but if it doesn't matter at all, what's the point in having her? Uh, so I still come back to that. <laughs> no, it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, but yeah, it could also, you know, yeah. Well, I'm just going to agree with you because if I try to reason it out too much, I'm going to talk in a circle for an hour. <laughs> But overall, like the episode, I am still enjoying the show quite a bit. Uh, for me, it's still the best Trek I've seen since Next Generation went off the air. So, Chris, where are we headed next week? All right. Nurse Chapel is trying to hitch a ride off-world in a freezing slum. Her spiritual mentor is mutilated by a devious alien hybrid. With the help of a genetically enhanced La'an, she must transform into a mutant in order to avert disaster and save her dimension. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait to see this one. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, guys, if you have any questions, comments, theories you want to run, run by us, hit up our website at strangenewtrekshow.com. Or follow the links in the show notes for this episode in your podcast app of choice. Also, if you do get over to the website, go hit the, the store button because it'll take you over to a page with affiliate links to the uh, Strange New World's uniforms and badges and props and all sorts of other cool stuff on there. That if you do buy, you help out the show a little bit and we would really appreciate it. Please rate and review us wherever you uh, listen to us at. It's one small step for you, but a giant leap for this show. And we give a special thanks to Miguel Esparza for the strange new Trek theme song, as well as Will Harding for running our YouTube department. Thank you, guys. And thank you for listening. Don't forget to set your phasers to stun and join us next time as we're on to the next Planet of the Week. <laughs> <laughs>